This is Capital Ideas TV. Coming up on the show, Organic Garage founder Matt Lurie on the company's healthier food for less concept and quadrupling revenue by 2019. The CEO of Diamcor, ramping up diamond production with Tiffany as a shareholder and its main buyer. When you invest in Organic Garage, you're investing in the passion and vision of Matt Lurie. He's a fourth generation grocer following the tradition of his great grandfather and great grandmother who started a grocery store in Toronto in the late 1920s. Lurie owned Subway franchises at the age of 20, then ran an organic food stand which led to his founding of Organic Garage. The company recently opened their third store in the junction in Toronto with plans to open several more and quadruple revenue to $60 million by 2019. Organic Garage differentiates itself through its brand, customer experience, product offerings, and value proposition. The company says a customer pays between 8 to 24% less than competitors. To find out how they do it, here's our conversation with the main dude at Organic Garage, Matt Lurie. So Matt, because you're uh, a fourth generation grocer, because your great grandfather had a store years ago in Toronto, how much is, has that background and history inspired you uh, in, in your journey to, to where you are now? It's inspiring to me. It's in my blood. It's something that comes naturally to me. So um, I'm just happy to pass, you know, continue the lineage. Now, when you were 20 or so, you had not one, but a few Subway franchises. Yes. Um, not a lot of young guys do that. So yeah. uh, how did you get the moxie to, to be an owner like that? Well, I always wanted to be a multi-unit owner and, you know, look at more the large picture in terms of running an organization. I think Subway at that time was very exciting because they were riding that crest of the healthy eating trends that were going on. And I think uh, it, it started the inspiration and the idea behind Organic Garage and trying to catch that wave similar to what's going on now with organics. Am I right in saying that at uh, one point in High Park in Toronto, you were uh, you had an organic stand at a, at a farmer's market? And, and if so, uh, what kind of lessons did you learn from Subway and from that experience? Yeah, well, the start of Organic Garage started as an outdoor market. So um, I set up a, a tent and tables to test the idea of affordable organics in High Park in Toronto. And uh, the concept went over huge. I mean, it showed an appetite in the community and the general population at large that wanted to be able to access organics for um, lower pricing than what they were paying um, traditionally. Um, and it helped start, you know, where Organic Garage is today. So then how did the evolution uh, uh, come along after that? Uh, well, the natural evolution was to find a bricks and mortar location. Um, so it's really a tent to bricks and mortar kind of story. Um, we were lucky to come across a location in Oakville, um, but we always wanted to get into bricks and mortar once the concept was proven. Now you talk a lot about your, your four differentiators, your four key pillars. You've got brand, experience, product offering, value proposition. Let's focus on brand. I notice a lot of signs around the store. You want to cut through the clutter for customers, be blunt in your messaging. How did that evolve? Yeah, it's just a transparency and an authenticity, and that's really foreign in today's retail. So we always want to speak to consumers on a one-to-one -one level rather than a top-down approach. And I think our, our messaging cuts through kind of that corporate babble speak um, that people don't want to hear anymore. Um, they want to get the truth. They want to hear the, the, the no-nonsense approach so that they can come in and get the idea of what we're trying to do in a matter of seconds rather than trying to discern it on their own. As far as the, the E part uh, of those four uh, differentiators, you're looking at uh, the experience um, for people. What kind of experience do you want customers to, to have and to feel when, they were, when they're in your stores? Well, we want it to be unique. Uh, we don't want to look and feel like a, a, any other grocery store out there, and we've been able to really achieve that in terms of the experience that consumers you know, walk into and while they're shopping um, experience in the store. So it was very important to look and function much differently than any other grocer, and whether that's using uh, natural materials, the sort of concrete floor exposed ceiling, bright colors, and even as simple as something as, you know, we use a live music soundtrack in our store. So anything that can separate us from our competition uh, is very important. And then with product offerings, you, you apparently don't want tons and tons of the same type of product. You want the best and the one or two top ones, is that right? 
Yeah, our focus is always the category leader and then the, you know, the secondary brand that spends to be like the number one. We find that dominates the majority of the sales. And then what we do is we infill with local or specialty. So I always use rice as an example where we always have a core rice brand. We always have the number two rice brand and then we infill with things like sprouted or flavored rices and then also any local vendors to help give local vendors um, exposure in the store. And then Matt, the value proposition, again, a customer going into your store compared to a competitor, what's the experience of like, what, what do they see, what do they find? Well, our goal is always to pass down affordable, everyday affordability. So we do that in a number of ways, whether that's through our, our flyer, which we have every 15 days, we have in-store specials going on, we buy manufacturer's clearance deals, we buy short coded dated deals, but then just our everyday pricing on the shelf. And we do that by leveraging you know, our operational infrastructure. We have a centralized warehouse and head office facility that helps centralize the purchasing where we can buy en masse and pass those savings down to the consumer. And even our operating principles, you know, uh, you know, our simplified labor format, you know, the size of our stores, the low occupancy overhead, anything that we can contribute to passing down those savings to consumers is what we're doing. Uh, tell us about the, the growth in organics versus uh, the rest of the, the uh, grocery sector. Uh, give us a sense how fast that's growing. Organics are growing double digits, so the Ontario marketplace is, uh, has lots of room for growth. Um, where traditional grocery is probably growing in the low single digits, organics has proven for the last five or ten years to be growing in the double digits. So it shows that, that fundamental shift. And that goes back to even my Subway days when I saw that firsthand, that healthy eating trend, you know, change and what that did for Subway, catapulting it to the largest franchise in the world. It's very similar now with the organic side. Um, we want to be in the position, and we are in the position at the right time with the right product mix to ride that crest of interest that's going on in the, in the marketplace. Matt, you were saying off air that investors always want to know about the expansion plan for Organic Garage, what's coming, what's, what's the plan, what kind of growth are, are we looking at here? Well, we're very excited. I mean, we just opened our junction location, which we're on site here today with um, in July, um, which went over very well. Uh, next year, we're um, planning to open in Liberty Village in Leaside, um, which we're very excited about. We're already close to signing um, at least for store number six. And then the overall prognosis is we, we anticipate to have between nine and 12 stores in, in the Toronto marketplace. Um, I think that's, that's going to catapult us to, you know, when we start looking at the outer areas to potentially our end goal of 20 to 25 stores in Ontario before we looking, start looking at other markets. So our, if I remember correctly, 2019, you're looking at basically quadrupling your revenue. Is that right? Yeah, we're on pace for that. I mean, barring that the occupancies go according to plan with the landlords that we're signing deals with, um, but we're well on that track and uh, exceeding our expectation in terms of landlord and developer interest to have Organic Garage as a part of their new developments tied into your growth and uh, tied into organics growth in general is the fact that Amazon made a lot of news the other day, a few weeks ago, uh, buying Whole Foods for ne nearly 14 billion. So not only are they buying an organics retailer, they're buying at a, at a premium. So what does that say about the sector? Well, I think it's good. I mean, I, when I speak to our, our investor base, I mean, uh, Amazon paid the uh, close to, if not the highest price ever for a grocery chain. And that grocery chain happened to be in the organic all natural sector. So it shows the appetite for even uh, companies outside the bricks and mortar channels that are focusing on, you know, what we're doing in this industry. And, sh you know, they're seeing that there's a, a huge demand um, and they want to be a part of it. So for us, as we continue along our growth path, I think it speaks um, very positively to our investor base to see that sort of interest in our market. Speaking of your investor base, uh, you've uh, done a lot of pitches, you've been in a lot of rooms talking to people, explaining the story. So, so, so make that case to people watching now to, who, who may be looking at your company and be curious and, and may be interested in investing. I usually like to summarize it. I mean, we're, we're the right brand at the right time with the right product mix and the right value proposition to capitalize on all the interests in organics. And I think that is important. Um, you know, you, you want to be have the right mix um, at the right time. Um, when that market starts to shift. And I think our, you know, our investor base, existing or new investors looking at us, should understand that we've positioned ourselves to really capitalize on that and that we have lots of runway for growth. I mean, uh, with nine to 12 stores in the Toronto marketplace, we just opened our third. Um, that year-on-year -year growth uh, potential is, is just astronomical. And I think it's going to show um, positively in you know, quarterly or yearly results that help feed the market. You've got over 40% insider ownership. Investors love to see that. Yeah, it just goes to show how invested the, the key players are. 
myself, our board of directors, um, we're very committed to the long-term um, growth potential of Organic Garage. And I think we all have the same similar vision of where we th think it can go. So I think that's a positive for any investor looking at the company as well. And maybe lastly here, Matt, uh, how fragmented is this sector and how, how underserved do you think it is? Uh, I think it's it's grossly underserved. I think that's why you know we want to grow to fill that void that's in the market. I think the chain stores are doing you know kind of a half toe in approach. You know they're satisfying what they feel the consumers want at a very base level, but consumers always evolve past that. And what we want to do is be able to satisfy those consumers when they say, you know, my local chain store isn't providing enough for us. And not only can they come into our store and be in a really cool environment, see all the same products, if not way more than what they can get at their chain store, but have very aggressive uh, pricing every day to win them over and make them regular shoppers. Is there anything we haven't talked about you'd like to uh, touch on? No, I just think it's been it's a very exciting time for Organic Garage, kind of the, the growth pattern that we're on. Our recent uplist into the TSX V Tier 1 um, provides our investor base, you know, increased liquidity and access to a different style of shareholder base. I think the, the, the market that we're growing in the Toronto market, um, it's the number one market in Canada, so it's the right right place to grow in to really expand our concept and to to gain that sort of publicity so i think from any outside investor looking at the company or inside investor i would just tell them it's really exciting all the things that we're up to and the path that we're on and the sort of attention that we're getting i think they should be equally ex as excited as i am some insider buying now and we're going to focus on canwell building materials which is a company we featured in our Capital Ideas Digest a few weeks ago in a cover story, and then the following week when National Bank named it a dividend all-star. The CEO has been buying in big time lately. 700,000 shares purchased since the beginning of April. In fact, the chief executive now owns nearly 18% of the company that he runs, Canwell Building Materials. Another one we're looking at is Stingray Digital. A director, Mark Pathy, now owns $4.3 million worth of the company. Since the beginning of April, he's been buying shares at various periods, as you see pointed out on the chart there. Recently, he's bought 151,000 shares of Stingray. Diamcor owns a diamond mine in South Africa, right next door to the third largest diamond mine in the world, which is owned by De Beers. Tiffany & Co. owns about 6% in Diamcor, injected about $10 million into the company, and has right of first refusal on all of its production. Diamcor is ramping up that production and higher revenue, cash flow, and earnings is sure to follow. Here's our chat with the CEO of Diamcor, Dean Taylor. Dean, you've got this diamond mine in uh, South Africa, right next door to De Beers. You bought it from De Beers. Describe what you have down there. Well, it's a, it's a rather unique deal, uh, Mark, in the sense that uh, what this is, is it's a very unique uh, deposit in that you have a direct shift of the top of the pipe of Venetia, uh, which has just been distributed in a fan deposit right next to Venetia. So we essentially coexist with uh, De Beers' flagship Venetia. Uh, and what our job really is, is it's very near surface where you've got this displacement. We essentially mine out the area along known channels of displacement, uh, remove uh, high content of sand, and uh, there's no blasting or underground, and essentially we uh, recover the diamonds that were displaced off of the top of the pipe of Venetia. So really just a very simple open mine operation recovering uh, very high quality diamonds from a known source. So rather unique. How important do you think it is that uh, it is at the surface or near the surface, you're uh, right next door to De Beers in terms of credibility for you and credibility for the company? Well, I think being selected by De Beers to acquire it is, is the first thing. Uh, we do have a strategic alliance with Tiffany's. Tiffany's is a, a shareholder and a big, uh, a big funder of the company along with some bigger funds. Uh, there's a lot of credibility to it. It's a known source. So you, you eliminate a lot of the guesswork involved. Um, security, having the ability to have, uh, we have a, you know, coexist in, in terms of the airport. Uh, the security, all the different things that go along with this, and of course, operating next to a four, four and a half billion dollar mine, uh, it's their land all around us and, and on it uh, that we exist, and so the requirement for us to operate at a very high level is, is obviously there too. So it's a very good thing. It, it definitely adds to credibility. So Tiffany injected roughly $10 million? About $10 million that they did in a combination of uh, debt and convertible to venture. They're about uh, somewhere around five, six percent owner in the company, and in exchange for that, what we did is essentially gave them a first right of refusal 
uh, on any diamonds up to uh, 10.8 carats, uh, which anything above that is referred to as a special. Um, they pay market value and we adjust that as they go, but really uh, Venetia is synonymous with a very high percentage of gem quality, about 60-65% of what we get is very, very high quality uh, you know, gemstones. And so that's the attraction for Tiffany's. Um, as we go forward in time, a lot of the existing mines are getting older, so for them it's about ensuring that they have uh, you know, not all the supply they need, but anytime they see stones like that, they want to be part of it so that in the future they can get a hold of those. So, Dean, what stage are you at now in terms of capacity utilization at the mine? And give us a sense of how you're looking to ramp production. Well, it's, it's, it's been a situation where it takes a long time, as, as everybody knows in mining. It's not an easy thing to build a mine. So from the time we acquire it to getting it built in that has been about a seven-year exercise, a little longer than we wanted in terms of permitting, mining rights, uh, infrastructure, everything that we put in. Uh, at this stage, we're really completely done. We're, we're built out and we're in what would, we would refer to as the very last stages, which is large-scale trial mining, where what we do is we run the plant at increasing capacities, uh, and from the information we get from that, we make an initial production announcement, which we expect to make in the very short term. So it's a key inflection point for us right now where you've got this company with a, a very attractive share structure, very good partners, very good investors, very good project, all these different things. Not a lot of visibility, not many people know about us because it's a smaller type project but the reality is is it's it's at that stage now where the plant might run at 20 or 30 percent of what its total capacity is and now it's just a matter where it starts to ramp up so we know it breaks even we know it's a very low cost operation and what we expect to see now over this quarter and the next ones coming is a slowly an increase to where we want to target profitability and earnings and all these kind of things and so it's a very exciting time the value proposition as we talked about is is uh, you know from our uh, my point of view and in our opinion right now is it's insane in terms of you know the value proposition today to what it would have been five years ago even though it was a great idea then the risk level and and the execution now being done uh, is very very attractive. So you want to get to ten thousand carats production a month near term and then twenty thousand beyond. Yeah, that I mean, yeah. yeah. When we look at things, I mean, for us it all based you know it comes down to tonnage. We we look at everything in terms of okay, we know what kind of tonnage we can put through. We know the grade is is somewhat variable, uh, you know, from areas that we go into. But certainly any project like this that we look at that has the capability to put the kind of tonnage we're we're talking through. The plant facilities are very large. You know, five hundred ton an hour uh, is is what what we're looking at ultimately capacity uh, based on what we see in the inferred grades and in that then yeah it's realistic to have a target of, uh, of those numbers in the in the reasonable short term and over the longer term we've always felt like the immediate area we have a large large land position uh, we've always felt like uh, you know establishing a quarter million carat a year operation for you know a 15 year life of mine was very very doable uh, in the short term the information we had on the deal from the De Beers work would indicate that we can get it built up and running uh, into cash flow, production, earnings, those types of things. And then very shortly, in fact, we're doing that now, start expanding outward and it just keeps growing. So it's kind of unique in that you've got this short-term cash flow, uh, you know, revenue earnings p potential with a built-in element of exploration or growth after the fact. So we think, uh, look, it, somebody will be mining there for a long, long time. Uh, so there's a lot of area to cover. Can you give us any numbers in terms of uh, revenue projections, cash flow, earnings, let's say, into 2018-19? You know, when we look at it, again, we always look in terms of what is the potential or what are our, you know, our thoughts in terms of what are the capabilities or targets. Um, you know, look, I think that based on the grades we see, the tonnage we expect to do in that, we've always felt like, uh, you know, short-term earnings potential, uh, you know, in the 20, 30, 40 cents a share range and moving up from there is definitely uh, something that we can do. Uh, the share structure, like I say, is absolutely key key to that. Um, we have about 55 million shares, which is extremely unusual for a junior uh, to come into a situation where you've got any type of a mine developed. Uh, usually, you know, one would expect uh, share structures to be more in the two, three, four hundred uh, million range, which obviously has a dramatic uh, impact on, uh, on what we're going to see in terms of cash flow and earnings for, for existing shareholders. The, the markets aren't recognizing the story right now. The, the stock has done well in the past, but uh, it's low right now. So. Yeah. What is the market not getting? What, what message do you want to get well, to? Well, I, I think what happens with any of these deals is, uh, you know, especially for us, when you develop this type of a project, you don't, you know, it's, it's lower capex, you develop it 
you have to really put the infrastructure in in order to you know really run at high levels or 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 be able to to get to the production scenario or make an initial production decision so I think that guys get fatigued where you know they see us recovering diamonds from the testing and the development of the plant uh, we've sold off about 90,000 uh, carats they look at it incorrectly sometimes in the sense that they want to see month over month and quarter over quarter growth not really fully realizing that what's happening is this massive infrastructure is being put in place and at some point the thing turns on the flips the switch and then it turns into a pr initial production and, and, and your numbers go up. So I think there's a little bit of that. The sector itself isn't widely followed. Um, you know, uh, some really good deals like uh, when we look at Stornoway and Mountain Province and these guys have had uh, some teething issues with uh, the initial startup of those projects which they'll figure out and, and their stocks will recover. But in general, you know, everything seems a little beat up. But it's that time of year and I think uh, our timing is, is perfect. So I think right now it presents a tremendous value for guys to look at and uh, I think we're going to, you know, w once we move forward from here, we'll, we'll recover to the highs we had before and I believe we'll move well past those. And lastly, you're planning a dividend at some point? I love the idea of dividend. Most of our shareholders, uh, when we look at it, the mistake a lot of guys will make is as soon as they, if they're lucky enough to get to a point where they uh, generate some significant cash flow, uh, you know, it tends to be, uh, let's go and buy another deal or let's do this or that, which is fine if it can add to your you know, overall company and it makes logical sense. In this particular case, uh, I think it generates enough uh, and has enough potential to generate uh, cash flow. We've demonstrated that we can be profitable on a very, very low number of carats already. And uh, so really, I think most of our guys from the perspective uh, that we see it, the big shareholders would love to see a, a base dividend. We're going to get some big stones. Um, those essentially, you know, you can get you know, a four or five million dollar stone for us is very realistic. Uh, the potential is there all the time. We're running that bigger material now. Uh, those translate into as much as 10 cents a share or roughly 10 cents a share in earnings with zero cost. So it definitely has that element to it and that's what we like to see. We think that'll uh, keep shareholders in, that'll uh, give them good return and it'll bring new shareholders in. So uh, yeah, that's our, that's our focus. Let's look at some 52-week highs and lows for you now. Oftentimes when these stocks hit these levels, they go on to higher highs and lower lows. We'll start with Finning International, the Caterpillar distributor. A nice, meaningful breakout here with conviction beyond the 27.25 level, a 52-week high there. On the other side of things, how about MediaGriff? Multiple 52-week lows here on this company, an e-business solutions provider. It had been much higher several months ago, but again, a big drop there past 14.75. We'll also have a look at uh, another energy company. And what's interesting, uh, as we know, these stocks have been getting hit for a long time now. Real concern about just too much supply out there on the market. But even the midstreamers, even the, the steady ones that pay dividends, the pipeline type companies, they're getting hammered and thrown out as well. Kiera, a good example, is that breaking through the 37 level, which was support hitting multiple 52-week lows. From the heart of the Financial District in downtown Toronto, that's our show for this week. I'm Mark Bunting. To not miss an episode of Capital Ideas TV, you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more great investment ideas through our Capital Ideas Digest and Morning Note, subscribe to CapitalIdeasResearch.com. Thanks for watching. Thanks for investing like a pro. We'll see you next time.